I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to begin reading at verse 23. And I invite you to stand with me as you're able to and honor the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment on himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many asleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. We may not be condemned with the world. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. You may be seated. In this letter, we see Paul writing to a very troubled Corinthian church, a church with a lot of problems. And some say, well, every church has a lot of problems. And that is true, and there's one reason why that is true, because every church is made up of people. And where there are people, there are problems. Where there are people, there are conflicts. Where there are people, there is sin. Now, the people that we read about in 1 Corinthians had no reservations about treating some people in higher regard than others. They would treat some better than others. They had no qualms about withholding their food from those who were less fortunate. See, every time they gathered, on, every week when they gathered, they, they had what, what was called a, a love feast or an agape meal. And this preceded the Lord's Supper. And if you want to think of it, I guess the closest way we can think of it in our terms today would be like a covered dish or a potluck. Now imagine showing up to a potluck, bringing your your best dish, putting it out, but saying, okay, that family over there, they can't have any of it. They're not worthy. That's what the people in Corinth were doing. They were withholding some of the food from some of the families they didn't think were worthy. Now, Paul opposed this behavior very strongly. And in his letter, he warned that they were not honoring the memory of Christ's death for their sins. In fact, he told them that They were actually sinning at the table of the Lord, at the communion table. He wanted it to stop. And so, as we look at this passage that we've read this morning, I want us to notice a couple of things. First of all, we want to notice the proper elements for the Lord's Supper. We see that in verses 23 through 26. And the elements are very simple. Bread and the cup. The bread, um, you know, Christ received or gave these instructions directly to Paul. Now, Paul had accepted Christ uh, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after he had been persecuting churches and Christians. He was saved miraculously on the Damascus Road. And for three years, Paul was instructed by Christ And one of the things Christ instructed him in was the Lord's Supper. 
So he shared what he had learned with his readers. And, and, and he did so with authority because he had learned this from Christ. He said, he said uh, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Here's where, here were his instructions. First of all, there would be bread. The bread was to represent the body of Christ, very simply. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He suffered many abuses on his way to the cross. His body was, was torn and, and beaten. He was in very rough shape when he got to the cross. And then on the cross, he suffered even more. The bread representing his body symbolizes all of the abuse that he took for us in his body. The physical beating, the physical abuse for you and me. Then there's the cup. The cup would represent the blood of Christ. The blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. The Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. We know that in the Old Testament, animals' blood was shed as a sacrifice for sin. But the shedding of Christ's blood was a once and for all cover of our sins. Christ shed his blood for us. The sacrifice that we needed settles it forever. None of us ever has to, to shed our blood for our sins again. Christ never has to shed his blood for our sins. No animal will shed blood for our sins. And so Paul tells us that celebrating these elements, the people of the church are celebrating the sacrifice of Christ. The church is recognizing the high price that was paid. You know, we may say, well, this is, this is just a little piece of bread and a little bit of grape juice. What it represents is so much more valuable. Body, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, when we, when we complain about the small sacrifices we have to make, when things are not as comfortable at church as we'd like them to, to be, remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. His body, completely broken for us. His blood, spilled out, shed to cover our sins. So there is a, uh, an importance to the elements, the proper elements for the service. But there's also, perhaps more importantly, proper attitude that we should have toward the Lord's Supper. And we read about this in, in verses 27 through 29 when, when Paul reminds us that it's important that we examine ourselves, that we judge ourselves you know it we're all pretty good at judging other people aren't we a lot of folks in church are good at judging other people but we are called to judge ourselves Paul says you know there are two ways in which we can take the Lord's Supper and Paul makes this plain as well there are those who examine themselves before they take the supper and those who are judged for not examining themselves. See, those who examine themselves before partaking are the ones who are, Paul described, taking it in a worthy manner. We know that 
Ultimately, none of us are worthy in ourselves, of ourselves, to partake of the Lord's Supper. None of us are worthy to sit at his table. But to do so in a worthy manner is something we can all do if we examine ourselves and get ourselves right with him. Confessing our sin. Repenting of our sin. So when we confess our sins, the Bible tells us he's faithful and just to do what? To forgive us our sins. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To restore unto us a proper fellowship with himself. But those who, are, who do not examine themselves are, are, are inviting justice upon themselves. Those who choose to behave flippantly toward the church, toward the sacrifice of Christ, who don't take seriously the sin that's plaguing their lives, those who may be called by other Christians as merely Sunday Christians, those who may be called by those outside of the church as hypocrites, or as those who sit and soak and sour in the pews. Usually the ones who find fault in others at church. In everything about the church sometimes. The chronic complainers. Those who are not involved in daily Bible reading. Those that are separating themselves from God and his people. The ones who should reflect and repent before sitting at the Lord's table. Because in the remaining verses, verses 30 through 32, Paul tells us that there are consequences for this kind of behavior. He says, first of all, that many are weak. Many are sickly, ill. This is called chastening. Those who have accepted Christ as Savior but are not living for the Lord. The Lord chastens us. The Lord chastens us because He loves us. He wants us to get back on track. He wants us to be disciplined. He wants us to check ourselves for not being chastened. If we're behaving sinfully, if we are living sinfully and we are not being chastened, we need to ch check ourselves whether or not we are actually saved. Whether or not we are actually Christians. Are we true believers? Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And there are many Christians in this condition. So before you partake of the Lord's Supper, examine yourself. Examine yourself. Paul goes on to, to make an even stronger point when he says that many have died or many have slept or fallen asleep. And, and that's a term for that he uses for Christians who have died. See, the judgment is terminal. The Bible talks about Christians sleeping. Those who, who die but have a relationship with Jesus. In other words, some Christians die prematurely because of their sin. They are paying the consequences for their sinfulness. They are not fulfilling the plan that God has for their lives. Don't let things go too far. There's sin in your life, cut it off at its root. 
Scripture says when, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The Corinthian church had some real problems. And an honest assessment today reminds us that the church of Jesus Christ has some real problems. We see it all over the world. We see it, I believe, particularly here in the United States. The church has some real problems. There are Christians who, among other things, come to the Lord's table without examining their lives, without judging themselves. And, and Paul says, if you judge yourself, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, you can get right, but if you fail to judge yourself, you're bringing on judgment. You're bringing on God's judgment. When we fail to examine our lives, we're challenging God's word. And every time we do that, we lose. We lose. We're not going to convince him that his word is wrong and our attitude is right. We're not going to convince him that he is wrong and, our, and we are right. Our thoughts are right. We lose every time. God is going to deal with the world, including his children. If you're here today and you haven't been examining your life, I want to invite you to do that. If you're here today, Christian, and you've never given a, an honest examination of where you stand with God, not just for eternity, but for life down here. For service to Him. For service in the church. I invite you to do that this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed. Would you, this morning, would you just take a moment and examine yourself? Are you able to partake of the body and the bread or the body and the cup? Body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. Are you able to do that in a worthy manner? Or is there some sin? Some sin that you need to confess. The Lord's Supper is a service of, of worship, an exciting time to gather with God's people and acknowledge what Jesus did for us. Christian, examine yourself right now. If there's anything in your life that needs to be cut out, Confess it. Confess it to Jesus. Repent. Quite simply, stop, turn around, and go the other way. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, you've never made that all-important decision to accept his sacrifice on your behalf. Would you do that today? See, this is not just bread and grape juice. It's not the literal body and blood, but it is representative of the body blood of the one who loves you more than anyone who went to the cross and died for you would you trust him today you say well I don't I'm not good enough none of us are good enough you say well I do this and I live this way and there's so many things I need to give up or start doing 
That's not how it works. You come to Him. He changes you from the inside out. Your brothers and sisters in Christ will be patient and encouraging to you as you become what God has called you to be. But you've got to take that first step. You've got to say, yes, I believe. And I want Christ to be my Lord. Maybe God's led you to this church and He wants you to be a part of this family of faith. Would you come this morning? Before we partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper, I want you to have the opportunity to examine yourself, to come, kneel at this altar if you need to, to have someone pray with you, or right where you are, to confess whatever it is that you need to get right with Him. Would you do that this morning? Heavenly Father, your Holy Spirit speaks to us. And we know that we are not worthy, but we want to partake of these elements in a worthy manner. We want this to be a true time of worship. So help us now to be obedient in all you'd have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.